So good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to welcome you all to this webinar. Um, this is going to be um, beekeeping and Vespa Mandarinia too. Um, I'll introduce myself as Cassie G. Horse. I work for the Washington State Department of Agriculture as an outreach specialist. Um, I'm gonna kind of be behind the scenes moderating this evening's webinar, and it'll be presented in collaboration with Dr. Samuel Ramsey from the Ramsey Foundation and Kelly Kalonick from Washington State University's B program. Um, tonight's presentation is actually kind of continuation of a webinar we hosted in July of 2020 that was focused with you as beekeepers as well. Um, before we get rolling, just a couple housekeeping reminders for you. If you can, please turn off your video if you're not a presenter and actively speaking. Um, the bandwidth on this WebEx isn't very strong, so it helps everybody hear clearer and see clear with our presenters. The other thing too, if you can go ahead and mute your mic while people are talking, that helps us get less feedback. Um, if you happen to have questions, there's a chat box on the side or the bottom. Feel free to post questions in there. We will have time at the end for all, you all to answer questions. Um, if you're having any tech issues, go ahead and message me privately and I'll help you work through those. So with that being said, I wanna introduce one of our, our first guest speaker, Dr. Sam Ramsey. Um, he has enduring interests in insect biology for well over 23 years, and I don't see any signs of that waning anytime soon. Um, he earned his doctorate from Dr. Dennis Van Eaglesorp's lab at the University of Maryland, but he definitely maintains a focus on how insect research can benefit the public through the development of integrated pest management strategies and lots of STEM outreach based initiatives. So we're really grateful for Dr. Ramsey having graduated with Bachelor of Science in Etymology from the Cornell University in 2011 and focusing his research on this predatite parasite behavior. He has a super interesting talk and I can't wait for him to share it with you tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause the, my screen and share that role over with him. So give me one second. I will hand that over. All right, Dr. Ramsey, you should be good to go. All right. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And everybody, I am excited to be here. Uh, I spend a, a lot of my time talking about honeybees and generally a lot of their parasites. But this one is a bit outside of the typical set of presentations that I give. Now, this is one that I've given once before, uh, but to a group of researchers and individuals who are working on trying to mitigate the issues with uh, the Asian giant hornets. But uh, it, it actually may be interesting for beekeepers and other individuals to hear about what it's been like for me in Thailand and my time trying to manage Asian hornet populations on their own turf. Things, uh, things get interesting. <laughs> so I'll jump right in <clears throat> and I'll make sure to save plenty of time for questions. So uh, a big question that comes up a lot is, why are there so many bee pests? I mean, seriously, we have got everything from varroa mites and tropolalaps mites and all kinds of different moths that get into colonies and beetles. Everything is running around inside of honeybee colonies. What makes this system so attractive? Why would you want to try to infiltrate a colony full of stinging insects? There are more than 25 species of organisms from at least seven, seven different orders that find their way into honeybee colonies and try to set up shop. So why is that? Well, we, in order to answer that question, we really have to dissect the hive a bit. So if you'll bear with me for a moment, I want you to get a good idea for why things like hornets want to get in here so badly. Uh, to, to begin with, honeybee colonies are made out of wax and wax actually has uh, a fair bit of nutrition locked up in it. Uh, but in addition to that, it is a wonderful building material and if organisms can steal it, there's cool things that they can do with it as well. But then the food that they collect is stored inside of the colony in such a way that it tends not to really be able to spoil. Uh, for the most part, honey can sit around for thousands of years as a very uh, a wonderful source of energy for organisms that consume it, and they can continue to consume it pretty much forever. They figured out how to preserve food before we ever even embarked on that concept. 
And then in addition, the ways that they store pollen also helps to maximize its longevity. And so they've got a great system here where they have figured out a wonderful matrix to store all of their food in, the, the wax that's used there, which is also to some organisms a food in and of itself. They've found uh, some great foods to then store there. And in addition to all of that, their babies are inside of this colony and they are a great source of food. Uh, honeybee brood is incredibly nutritious. We think all the time about organisms breaking into colonies, and one of the ones that's the most famous for it, people think of bears. Uh, even the, the honey jars that are often sold in stores are shaped like bears. People have had the perspective for thousands of years that bears were breaking into colonies specifically to get honey, and that is incorrect. What bears actually need when they're breaking into these colonies is a good source of protein and a good source of fat, because they're oftentimes, the, the times when they're most likely to do this are in the fall and the winter, when uh, or just before the winter, when they need that source of fat and protein to sustain them. Uh, they don't need a bunch of sugar. They don't need a lot of energy. They're going into a low energy stage. And then uh, there are times in the spring where this can occur as well, because uh, the the fats that they have lost over the time that they have been overwintering, they need to replenish. So it's actually these blobs of fat, these honeybees that are full of all of this white fat body. Uh, it is uh, pretty much entirely what you're seeing when you look at honeybee brood. Their skin is transparent and all of that white gooey stuff is their fat body and it is incredibly nutritious. So that's actually what the bears are after and a number of other creatures uh, from organisms like hornets and even things like varroa mites that get into these colonies to go after the brood. And the brood is incredibly vulnerable because it doesn't have legs uh, during most of its development. Uh, during most of their development, they just look like little maggots. They have no ability to defend themselves, uh, no, no, not even an ability to see at that stage. And so they're defenseless little organisms that happen to also be squishy and delicious. And that is a rough combination. That's the reason why we see such great diversity uh, of the, the hornets. So there are multiple hornet species, uh, about 23 by most counts. Um, but of the hornet species, the ones that uh, you can find throughout Asia, many of them have a very strong association with honeybees. And these are the five species of bees that they tend to go after most frequently. Uh, so Apis mellifera, which is the one that we know of the best, uh, that's the, the Western honeybee, but there's also the Eastern honeybee, Apis serrano, which is very similar to Apis mellifera in a number of ways, but a bit smaller and better adapted to Asia. Uh, and then you've got Apis dorsata, the giant honeybee, and then the two dwarf honeybee species, species Floria and Adreniformis. And what you're seeing over here on the left of this list of hornets that we know go after honeybees, Vespa mandarinia, Vespa affinis, and Vesta, tropic, uh, Vespa tropica are the ones that I have most consistently encountered in my time uh, working with honeybees in Southeast Asia. Um, and of those, uh, Vespa mandarinia is the one that I've seen the least of. It's really been these two that have been the real problem here. These are the lesser and greater banded hornets. Oh, um, looks like somebody just logged on and is having a difficult time seeing. I hope we can resolve that. So. The Asian giant hornets are really the, the, the topic of so much conversation as of late because they are such fascinating organisms. Uh, they're also in the category of extreme. They have so many different extremes in their size, in their aggression, in their, their, their stingers. Like there's so much about them that exists on the extreme end of the spectrum. And so even though <clears throat> there are multiple hornets that do what they do, they do it the best and are the most feared for it. They're a eusocial species. So uh, if you think about eusocial organisms, bees are a great example of that. Creatures that are governed by a queen and have an all for one, one for all sort of mentality, where all of them are working toward making sure that the queen can continue uh, reproducing such that the colony can be sustained. So these hornets function in a very similar way. There is a queen inside of this colony uh, for a small portion of the colony's 
duration. The queen will actually leave the colony consistently to collect food and do the work of a worker as she raises the first generation of worker hornets. After she's done raising them, she stays in the colony for the rest of her life. And this is where things really get interesting because the complicated social behaviors start building up and you really see intelligence emerge as these creatures go about their business. Something that I've found to be the most interesting about them is that they are, um, well, I'm gonna coin a term here. They are predatory vegans, which, I mean, maybe we'll have to change this term later if people uh, spend too much time misunderstanding what I'm saying, <laughs> but they are vegans. Like they do not actually consume the meat that we think of as them eating. They hunt for other creatures and they chew them up, chop their legs off, uh, form them up into a meatball, and then they take that back to their colony. They're not capable of eating it. Their esophagus forms something like a sieve that narrows such that they can only feed on fluids. So what they actually eat is nectar from flowers. They will consume sap from trees, but they can't actually eat the solid matter that you'll constantly see them hunting for, including the honeybees um, whose colonies they're consistently breaking into. So when you hear in the news that these organisms are flying about and eating your bees, technically they're not. Their babies are eating your bees. They take that ball of meat back to their colony and their offspring are capable of actually chewing it up and consuming it. And then their babies regurgitate this very, um, this, this heavily amino acid rich mixture, basically a ton of protein all broken down in this fluid that they're able to consume and get all the proteins that they need in order to keep their bodies working. So it's a very weird system, but a really interesting one. But in Asia, as a result of these hornets being so embedded in the environment, the entire system of beekeeping is built around these hornets. This is an apiary at the Bee Breeding and Genetic Center in Thailand, in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And you'll see that all of these colonies out here are just single boxes, just one little hive body. And they're designed to prevent the entry of Vespa into the colonies. These apiaries are oftentimes in these forested areas, and that's where a lot of these hornets live. And so you have to have a way to deal with their potential incursions. Now, as the hornets show up, they'll have to contend with the fact that these colonies are structured in a way to specifically keep the hornets out. So take a close look at this colony because this is what colonies typically look like in the majority of the areas where these hornets are present. Uh, these are called Taiwan style colonies, and you'll see that there is a very small uh, entrance, uh, two uh, small entrances at the front of the colony, but they don't have that long strip that we think of uh, in so many of the colonies here in the West. These tiny little strips are there such that they can allow the bees inside. They're just about the height of a bee, but will exclude hornets when the hornets are trying to get inside. But hornets are pretty wily. They're an excitable group of organisms, and they will try very hard to get into these colonies, uh, stopping at nothing. So hornets can, if given enough time, chew at this wood enough that they can break into the colony. When individuals see that there's an entire squadron of hornets there trying to get into the colony, they will fold down this top panel that you see here. Uh, you can push a piece of wood over it, that uh, this little latch right here that keeps it closed, and you can keep the hornets from getting inside and so you can develop a better plan uh, to protect your colonies. I've had to do that on more than one occasion during my time in Thailand. Now, the interesting thing here, I've been studying parasites of honeybees in Southeast Asia but I've been focusing on the parasites. So I've been focusing on organisms like the Euveroa mites and the Tropolelaps mites, two groups of parasites that we do not have in the United States, but organisms that have started to expand their geographic range such that we should be concerned about them eventually arriving here. Well, the hornets that I was consistently dealing with were not the organisms that I was in Thailand to study. So I'm still kicking myself now as I think about all the opportunities that I had to collect these hornets because now I'm working with uh, aphis 
Um, they want me to collect as many hornets as I can find. And I'm thinking now about all the opportunities that I squandered where hornets were uh, just dead on the bottom boards of my colonies, or we were whacking them out of the air with tennis rackets and things. And I could have stuffed them in a jar such that um, we could do genetic analysis on these creatures. But, you know, you live and you learn. So as these hornets are going after the colonies, uh, there is a specific period of time that we are trying to guard against. The, the hornet's hive hunting behavior, it progresses through three distinct phases. The first of these phases is the hunting phase. And you'll notice that you'll see hornets flying about in Southeast Asia in a lot of these apiaries. They'll just hover in front of the colony. And there are some complex behaviors going on here. The hornets have incredibly good eyesight. Their eyes are much more complicated than the eyes that you'll see in a lot of other insects. They're more on par with what you see in dragonflies and praying mantids, uh, the kinds of eyes for an organism that needs to process information very, very quickly and in really, really, really deep detail. So they've got all the facets and they're looking at these colonies, attempting to create an image here of what they need to come back to. Now, they want to know about the colony's productivity, and so they will typically scout in front of the colony, and they will attempt to get inside, because if they can grab a sample from inside of this colony, they know, okay, this colony has a good deal of brood. It will be a good resource for us to train uh, or for us to, um, to, to activate the colony's instincts such that a bunch of the other females in this colony will alight on that honeybee nest and destroy it, taking away all of the brood. So the hunting phase is the most important phase in this process. If as a beekeeper in Southeast Asia, you see a single hornet flying in front of your colony and just kind of buzzing around sort of in a circular pattern back and forth looking at your colony, you need to dispatch that particular hornet. Uh, it, or at least that is what they do in Southeast Asia. I don't want to advise you guys to do something of that nature because things can go a little wrong there as has happened to me and I'll tell you all about it as this presentation progresses. So um, when that hornet is flying in front of the colony, if you can knock it out of the air and kill it, that hornet cannot return to its colony and tell them what it found. You have stopped the reconnaissance mission. You've stopped that organism from gathering intel and taking it back to the colony. So that's the most important time if you are trying to save the life of that colony, because the next step in this process, it is over for your bees. If you see multiple hornets arriving, that's the end. Cut it. Um, cut your losses right there. That is that is the end for this colony. More than a dozen hornets typically arrive at a colony. Sometimes up to 36 hornets will show up at these colonies and just ransack the place. They'll begin destroying every single adult bee in the colony in this really focused phase that is actually kind of terrifying to watch. Uh, they just start vibrating back and forth, looking in every direction, grabbing anything that's buzzing near them and chopping its head off. So all the adults are beheaded. Sometimes they will also chop off the abdomen if the beheaded bee is still buzzing around, still trying to sting stuff. And then the occupation phase begins. And this is the time where it is very, very, very dangerous for you as a beekeeper. Many beekeepers have been stung uh, repeatedly uh, and there have been some problems and even casualties in this process. The colony will then occupy the inside of that, that hive and they will make constant trips back to their colony with these meatballs of ground up brood. They will scrape the brood away from the wax and they'll get a whole chunk of it from several different uh, larvae and pupae that they'll smoosh together into a ball and they'll keep packing it together such that they can get as much of it out of the colony as possible because the idea here is efficiency. They'll fly back to their colony with that ball of meat and feed it to their young. And these are specifically the young uh, queens and the young drones who are being developed because they will be larger than the typical worker cohort and they will need a lot of protein in order to develop in the numbers that, that these hornets uh, tend to raise their, their reproductive brood. So the problem here for a lot of beekeepers is that sometimes if they're not paying enough attention and they happen to open a colony that has been occupied by these hornets, 
Uh, the hornets will defend that colony with all of the ferocity with which they would normally defend their own nest. And so that is when beekeepers can be stung repeatedly and things can get pretty, uh, pretty frightening. So this is me at a colony and I really wish this was better quality, but uh, my lab tech was filming this and I want you to look very closely. <laughs> you see, uh, this is me attempting to dispatch them, <laughs> kind of rejoicing. This is the first one that I actually had the opportunity to, to knock out of the air. And um, that's what I kept seeing beekeepers in Thailand do. Uh, that one that you're looking at there, that's the greater banded hornet, so a bit smaller than Vespa mandarinia. And uh, if you could hear it in Thai, so I'm I'm rejoicing in Thai, Shashana. Uh, <laughs> but the other individuals there, they were uh, two two lab techs there who were saying uh, in Thai, Sammy, strike it, strike it, Sammy, hit it. And um, I had been very nervous to do that. I'd seen a bunch of other beekeepers do it, but I wasn't sure if this was something that you can do. What you'll learn very quickly is that when the foragers are in front of the colony and they're flying back and forth trying to get a picture of the, the potential nest there, they are heavily distracted. Their attention is turned almost entirely to the colony itself, and it makes them in a pretty easy target. Uh, if you hit them, you can knock them out of the air with very little reprisal. Um, I've knocked a few out of the air and missed while trying to step on them, and they've gotten up and flown away, not even gone after me, uh, which I was very surprised to see, but they tend not to do so when they're away from their sisters. Uh, I did, however, make the mistake, and this is, uh, I was actually on NPR talking about this um, last year, but I made the mistake of uh, swinging at a hornet who uh, had a couple of sisters with her because they had already started the process of flying to the colony such that they could clean it out. And uh, they, they, they did not like that. Uh, there was no video of this because no one wanted to keep a video going while they were coming after me. Um, one of them grabbed on to my bee suit and because uh, the bee suit that I had was larger than um, than my actual size, she couldn't get the stinger all the way through to my skin. There was a good deal of distance between the suit uh, and my skin. So she started trying to chew through it, which was upsetting to watch because she was succeeding. The, those, those mandibles, they can do a lot. Uh, they are actually tipped with uh, metal such that, so the same way that we have like iron in our blood, they concentrate deposits uh, of, of micro minerals into their jaws such that they are actually metal tipped and it allows them to chew really well through uh, multiple things. So, Everyone is yeah. not good. We've got what I believe are greater banded hornets that have just destroyed this colony, it seems. I don't think this colony is gonna survive if there's anything inside right now. And there's more coming. So that was a rough day, everybody. Um, I have been conducting a study in, or had been at that point, conducting a study in Southeast Asia uh, where I was testing uh, different sets of pesticides against a parasite of honeybees called the tropimite, uh, Tropolelaps mercedesi, the tropimite. Uh, and so I needed every single one of those colonies for the statistical analysis. And I learned on that day that you have to spend a good deal of your time, if you live in the range of these hornets, you have to spend a good deal of your time scouting during hornet season to make sure that you do not allow a scout into that colony. So making sure that the colony is well sealed. Um, some of these colonies are not made out of the best quality wood, and so the wood over time begins to sort of dry rot and the hornets can chew their way through much more easily. Uh, if you happen to see that hornets have found a way inside, uh, then you need to get that, that, that you, you, you kind of have to dismiss that particular loss of a colony. So keeping them from getting inside is the most important part. And uh, these colonies, they are specifically structured for this purpose, such that there are even uh, counterbalanced weight systems that are designed for them that they use throughout Southeast Asia to move them around. This really has nothing to do with the hornets. I just thought it was really cool that this counterbalance was their way of moving all 48 of my colonies uh, to the different locations where this study was occurring. Uh, so, you know, if you guys want one of these, uh, they told me that they're pretty expensive, but the price was actually, I think, uh, was it $2.16 in American money? So, you know, 
We'll get you one of those one day. Now, anti-Hornet defense systems. You may have heard that Hornets are not totally invulnerable organisms, and you are right. Bees have ways of overcoming the defenses of the Hornets and taking them down. But unfortunately, the things that I'm about to tell you about right now are not typical behaviors for Apis mellifera bees. Our bees are not the same bees that developed in uh, evolutionary time along with the hornets. Those hornets over in Asia, there were multiple species which created a very strong selective pressure for the different species of bees to learn ways to combat them. But Apis mellifera moved out of Asia millennia ago, and as a result of that, they developed without the presence of these hornets presenting a pressure for them to learn these remarkable abilities. And so there's one particular ability that recently showed up in the news, uh, which is really exciting, but also kind of gross, but exciting because it's insects using tools, which is really awesome. Uh, now, remember what I was telling you earlier about how the scout will hover out in front of the colony and it will attempt to kind of get a mental image of the colony itself. The mental image is important for them to fly to the colony and back. But what's even more important is the actual scent mark that they place on the colony. The scent mark is very pungent. It creates an odor on the front of the colony that the, the hornets are able to uh, use as a way to sort of taxi back to the correct colony and take it out. When that odor is erased for whatever reason, uh, the colony itself is then safe for the most part. That hornet uh, will get lost looking for the colony again and will eventually give up, which is wonderful. The bees figured this out at some point and we do not understand how this particular behavior came about, but they figured it out and this is incredible. The bees will actually fly to deposits of fecal matter because of just how pungent fecal matter is. The bees themselves can't erase the scent mark that's been uh, in, uh, just uh, smeared across the front of the colony by that hornet but they can plaster over it with something that has a stronger smell. So they will fly to a location that has excrement. Uh, in Vietnam, this was described with them collecting water buffalo excrement. Uh, they'll fly back with it and rub it along the front of the colony. And so you can see splotches of fecal matter uh, on the front of the colony. Uh, you can see that this particular uh, Apis serrana bee, so the Eastern honeybee, has a chunk of fecal matter in its jaws. This is one of the first examples uh, of insects utilizing tools, and it is quite a remarkable one. These, uh, the, the, the behavior itself is very well coordinated within the nest in similar ways to what you see when bees want to signal that there is a food resource outside of the colony that they need to actually go after. They will coordinate to go after a set of dung such that they can bring that back to the colony as well. So uh, yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. And you can see here, when they go after it, they go after it. All of those brown spots that you see there, uh, it's bovine fecal matter. Uh, it's always mammalian fecal matter, uh, as, as best as this has been described. But unfortunately, the defenses of Apis mellifera are fairly ineffective. Um, there is a behavior that's also been described where the bees can actually sort of coax the hornet into the colony as it's right in front of the colony. You would expect that the bees would be trying to be defensive against it to keep it from getting inside, but instead they kind of welcome it into the colony. They lure it inside and then a big ball of bees can be nestled right above it that drops down onto the hornet's body. Those bees begin to cover every surface of the hornet's body and that actually causes more bees to uh, then be um, uh, signaled to come over and land on that ball. And they all start vibrating their wings with such intensity, the flight muscles then generate a lot of heat. So they're, they're actually vibrating the flight muscles, not the wings. That heat and all the carbon dioxide through the process of respiration uh, suffocates the hornet and cooks them just like a convection oven. But Apis mellifera have not been shown to be able to, to do this sort of thing with any level of consistency. Uh, there have been a couple of sporadic descriptions of Apis mellifera bees doing it, but the best verified reports have only shown Apis serrana 
uh, showing this particular behavior. So what do Apis mellifera bees do under circumstances where the hornets get close? It's kind of sad, but they try really hard to sting them and it simply doesn't work. The exoskeleton of the hornets is extremely thick and it is impervious to them being stung under most circumstances. Uh, if they can really ball up around the hornet's body, uh, they can get their stingers into the sections of the hornet's body uh, where there isn't any armor. So the region between the hornet's head and thorax is a fairly, uh, it's, it's fair game for stings, but those stings tend not to be able to kill the hornet outright. Uh, they really do very little aside from make it angry unless a lot of bees sting them in the same area. So in case of hornet incursion in a colony, well, there's not a huge amount that can be done, but there are options. Um, there are situations where if only a couple of hornets have gotten inside, if the, um, the, the gate that you see there, I've seen beekeepers drop the gate down and seal, you know, maybe two hornets or one hornet inside of the colony such that uh, the other hornets who want to come in and help can't do so. And the hornets that are stuck inside have to contend with 10, maybe 20,000 bees. Uh, those bees, under those circumstances, sometimes can overwhelm that hornet. So as I was telling you earlier, the region between the hornet's head and thorax is a section where they can be stung. Many bees are going to die in the process of trying to get to that region because the hornet's jaws are so powerful that they can cut most of those bees in half. But sometimes the colony can be saved under those circumstances. The window for something like this happening is so small. And if you're not utilizing one of these special Taiwan style colonies, you typically won't have the opportunity to do that. You could potentially install an entrance inducer, uh, reducer, but many of the entrance reducers that we use in the US have a fairly large square uh, that the hornets can actually get through fairly easily. So, yeah, um, it can be pretty tough dealing with these guys in Asia. But there is advice. Now, beekeepers in Asia spend a good deal of their time protecting their apiaries. If the apiary is not protected, oftentimes it will be lost. And to underscore that point, when uh, I was conducting this project in Southeast Asia, the pandemic was declared right in the middle of the study. And so I had to leave, had to go back to the US. It took a lot of work to get back here, y'all. It took eight different flights before I finally got back there because things kept getting canceled and rerouted. It was a mess. But I finally got back to the US and being a, just as naive as pretty much everyone else was during the pandemic, I thought to myself, oh, it'll probably just be a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, and then I'll be able to head back to Thailand and finish my work. Little did I know that it would be more than a year. Well, within just a few months of me living Thailand, leaving Thailand, so uh, two months and a couple of weeks, uh, Hornets had cleaned out 42 of my 48 colonies. I want you to sit with that for a moment. I want you to think that through. It's a lot of colonies they, uh, that they took out. It's pretty upsetting because I bought all of those colonies <laughs> and I knew when I went back to do this again, I was gonna have to buy more of them. Uh, but yes, uh, these hornets can be a real issue. Um, so, Dispatching the foragers is the most effective means of controlling these organisms. And it's only a temporary solution because more foragers will typically show up if there is a nest nearby. So oftentimes when beekeepers realize that they have been seeing a lot of foragers, uh, they will go on a night search for a nest. This is something that I do not recommend if you are not well trained in this process, um, but searching out the nest in the middle of the night, um, they will typically get an oily rag um, and put it on a long pole, uh, set it on fire, and then stick it under uh, one of the colonies that's uh, in a, a, a nest that's exposed. Um, it can be dangerous, and yeah, they do that to just burn away the outer envelope of the colony. They don't want to burn up the entire colony itself because the, uh, the colony is very valuable. If you can take the brood back, uh, the brood is, is really important to them. So yeah, um, if you do this wrong, 
there can be hell to pay. <laughs> Mandurotoxin is some pretty potent stuff. Their stings are extremely painful and they have a very large venom sac, which is right, right here on their body. It's just a big sac full of venom. They're capable of stinging multiple times and their stings can be medically important, but typically uh, anything less than, um, anything fewer than a dozen stings is not typically medically important. It's just very painful. There will be localized swelling. Uh, and because of the uh, the kinins in this process, the set of proteins that will be circulating through your body, uh, the pain can spread quite rapidly to the rest of your body, causing this throbbing sensation. Um, but yeah, their venom is actually in a number of ways less toxic than honeybee venom, about a third as toxic as honeybee venom. But honeybees inject a substantially smaller amount of it into your body. They inject a much larger amount of toxin into your body every time they sting you, and they can sting more than once. Honeybees can only sting one time. This is uh, an example for you of what the hornet's stinger apparatus so this is the sting apparatus this is what actually goes into you so that's about a quarter of an inch long and then this is the actual venom sac that it is attached to and this is an image collected by uh, the wonderful jackie serrano uh, she is kind of a legend in her her bug dissections uh, and this is sort of a, a, a good comparison image for you to look at because here we have the yellow jackets that you'll typically see, so Vespula uh, germanica. And I just want you to compare that for a moment with the amount of venom that the Asian giant hornet has available to itself uh, by comparison to what you'll see in the typical wasps that we have around here. Uh, the kinins cause a lot of swelling. Uh, they're they're able to um, sort of open up blood vessels and, and cause that, that swelling. There are uh, histamines in this process that can cause radiating pain. And if enough of this venom ends up in your body, uh, one of the big medical problems that it can cause is that so many cells die at once that your body is not capable of properly uh, getting rid of them. And so as they're moving through your bloodstream, it can cause uh, organ failure, but that is for more than 36 stings, typically. Um, so several dozen stings can cause some, some really big problems um, and can even cause swelling of the brain. Um, but what has been seen and has really concerned people is that uh, necrotic lesions can develop with a lot of stings. That is often something that happens prior to multiple organ failure, where uh, the section where you've been where an individual has been stung just kind of melts a bit. But that is pretty unusual. Uh, these sorts of things typically only happen when someone disturbs a nest. And when I say disturb a nest, I mean disturbs it. So typically not someone just walking past it where they may be stung by one or two hornets. But uh, because these organisms nest in the ground, if you were to uh, have like power tools or some sort of equipment near them or try to cut down a tree that, uh, that their nest is at the base of, that is when uh, circumstances like this can, can cause some serious problems. Um, there have been a couple of elephants stung to death uh, by these hornets in Thailand that were chained to trees. And uh, because the elephants are very strong and are pulling at these trees, they can signal to the hornets that they are, are dangerous and the hornets can, uh, can take them down. So it's pretty upsetting. Um, so the input of beekeepers into the process of managing these hornets um, in colonies is very, very important. It is essential to the success of apiaries in areas where multiple hornet species are present. Uh, unattended apiaries are frequently lost. Um, they just typically can't make it for very long in the presence of these organisms. And so beekeepers have developed a wide array of means to strike these hornets right out of the air. Um, what I've seen most consistently are these electrified tennis racket things, uh, the, the electronic bug zappers. Um, but, you know, there are a lot less fancy versions of this. Some individuals will just use a regular tennis racket. Uh, and I've even seen individuals use hive tools and shoes um, as ways of, of swatting them out of the air. Beekeepers, uh, I, you, you may have heard that the very first 
uh, colony to be dispatched in North America was dispatched by beekeepers, and that some of these beekeepers didn't even have the sort of proper equipment for this process. They did a great job. Um, I am impressed by what they were able to accomplish. But um, it would not be a good idea for you to attempt the same thing. So you should never attempt to kill uh, a hornet colony if you do happen to find it. But if you do find one of these colonies, please do alert. Uh, right now it would be the Washington State Department of Agriculture because that's the only state in the US where they have been found so far. But should they show up in other areas, and if this is uh, helpful to any of you, if you could alert the United States Department of Agriculture or your local um, Department of Agriculture, it will be very important we have the technology, we have the right kinds of suits to dispatch these organisms, but it is not something that you should go after yourself. The best things that beekeepers can do, if you want advice for what you should do if you happen to have apiaries that are near regions where these hornets have been found, exclusion is the best thing that you can do. If you can narrow the entrance to those colonies, uh, that can give those bees a fighting chance uh, to keep them away from the nests. Uh, and yeah, the nests, um, you know what, I'm going to I'll go for four more minutes and then I would like to open the floor to questions. Um, so just to let you know, while the majority of colonies in Asia tend to be underground, there appears to be a subspecies, if not two subspecies, that are more likely to nest fairly high off the ground in trees. And we have found multiple times now uh, that the uh, the hornets that we are seeing in in North America, one of them uh, we've found nesting in the ground, but we are finding over um, uh, more than one incursion now that these hornets are showing up in trees. Now, underground, their colonies typically consist of these wide expanding nests. Um, and so because the uh, the space that they have in these underground burrows is so wide, there are typically only three, maybe four combs at most. But uh, in the trees, you'll typically see them structuring a much longer colony going the length of the, 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 the inside of that tree. And so you'll see sometimes six or even eight um, combs inside of that colony. And that's where their offspring are being raised. All of those white pouches that you see there, those are the uh, the, the, the cocoons of their offspring that are developing as adults. So this is the one that was found in Blaine um, in, in Washington State. And uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, nest tracking is pretty lucrative in Southeast Asia. Uh, one of the reasons for this, uh, you can actually pay people to hunt down nests for you um, just because there are so many hornets uh, in these different areas that can go after um, uh, go after bees in these regions, and so they will actually pay people for it. But the colonies themselves, they will collect. They won't kill the entire colony. They'll burn away the envelope. That flash of fire typically kills a bunch of the adults, but they will take back the um, offspring specifically because the offspring produce that fluid that I was telling you about, that densely proteinaceous amino acid mixture. Well, it has been shown that there are potential pharmaceutical benefits to this goo that comes out of the mouths of these bees, and so it's or out of the mouths of these hornets, uh, and so it's actually being sold as a pharmaceutical um, supplement in a, a few countries, actually, in Asia, um, and so uh, Olympic athletes and, and people will try to use these as a means of maintaining very healthy musculature because it seems to contribute. Uh, to the uh, efficient movement and working of muscles and the efficient building of muscles. Uh, and we think, or I shouldn't say we, um, the some elements of the spread of these hornets uh, as we see them moving about could be related to human beings intentionally moving them around because of this incredibly valuable the mixture that they produce. This amino acid mixture is sold uh, for substantial sums of money in Asia. And so there are people who have been interested in establishing um, colonies of them in regions where they are not native. And so you see some level of entrepreneurship 
with people trying to get these organisms to establish in other regions of the world. We don't have a specific region reason to believe that that is what ha what is happening uh, with the colonies that have been found in North America. Uh, but just to let you know, humans do assist in the spread of these organisms, either intentionally or unintentionally. The queens will nest in the or nest. The queens will overwinter in the ground, uh, and sometimes in piles of wood or in mulch. And when people are moving those around for landscaping and things, or digging and moving a lot of dirt around, uh, they can oftentimes be used. Uh, that can be used as a, a means of transport for these organisms. And with all of that said, I think that's the last point that I'm going to make before I open the floor to questions about these gigantic hornets. And uh, as I was saying before, the nests can get pretty large when they're underground. So yeah, take a look at that. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. It's always awesome listening to you. And I really enjoy um, the insight and the pictures you're able to offer. <laughs> If we don't mind, I'm actually going to toss this over really quick um, to Dr. Connick so she can share a quick fact sheet um, with the beekeepers and then open up the floor with all of you because I know their heads are spinning right now. Um, <laughs> and there's lots of things they are ready to share. So, Dr. Connick is a postdoctoral researcher um, with Washington really? State University. Yeah, <laughs> bee program. Um, she specializes in the honeybee health and beekeeping management practices. I mean, I have her here today because her interest in extension um, and science communication, she's really good at translating scientific results for us um, and giving us those outputs, especially as you stakeholders being beekeepers. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over and give her the chance to spread some knowledge with you as well. Thanks, Cassie. Um, let me go ahead and share. Yeah, Sammy and I know each other. We actually both got our PhDs um, at University of Maryland in the same lab. So Way good to back. see you, Sammy. Always a tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to try to switch this around a little bit um, and share kind of more from the beekeeper perspective, you know, things we hear beekeepers reporting in Washington um, and concerns beekeepers have when they see a bunch of dead bees near their colonies and it seems like their colonies have been attacked by something but they're not really sure what they're worried it might be asian giant hornet um so the idea here is to do a little bit of crime scene investigation and help you kind of distinguish between colony damage from asian giant hornet or if it might just be something else that is still annoying but not quite as terrifying as asian giant hornet so uh, as we know um, we are very lucky Hornet discovered in Washington State in Whatcom County in 2019. Um, and yeah, I moved from Maryland to here since that happened. So um, kind of willingly stepping into this situation where we have the Asian giant Hornet. Um, but I'm way down here in the in this other corner of the state, the southeast corner. So hopefully they won't make their way all the way down here. But um, you know, as Sammy mentioned, these Asian giant hornet colonies can reach peak populations in the late summer and early fall. And this is sort of where the hunger of these colonies starts to grow and where you might start to see them um, poking around your beehives if you're in this area. And so far, um, they have pretty much, you know, stayed contained to this super northwestern corner of Washington and probably also, you know, right across the border in Canada. Um, so, you know, the first thing to know is that you're if you're outside that region and you see huge piles of dead bees around your hives, it's probably not from Asian giant hornet because they haven't made it very far yet. So, um, you know, that can kind of help ease your mind if you're not located right in that immediate area. Um, and also, as Dr. Ramsey mentioned, we have sort of distinct phases of Asian giant hornet predation on honeybee colonies. Um, and this is where I think um, as beekeepers, we kind of tend to like combine these two um, and kind of get mixed up about um, what's exactly happening when. So I'm going to take you through a little bit like in a little bit more detail what you will see in your colonies in each of these phases um, and then show you some pictures too. So during this hunting phase, remember, this is when um, you know, one hornet will kind of start checking out your hives um, and seeing what's going on. So they will wait outside the honeybee colony entrance and sort of hover there um, and they might pick off individual bees. So when this is happening, they're picking off adult bees. 
they'll take that bee away from the hive, um, usually up in a tree kind of nearby. So basically what they're doing is removing the bee from the hive and then they're trying to take that meal back to their nest, but they don't want to take the whole bee because a lot of the bee is, you know, isn't very tasty or useful to the colony. So what they'll actually do um, is remove the thoracic muscles from the bee. And it basically forms this delicious little muscle protein packed meatball um, that the hornet can carry back to its hive. So they will, you know, bore a hole in the thorax of the bee, which as a beekeeper, many of us have seen dead bees outside of our colonies that have holes in the thorax or their heads removed or both. Um, so the thing to remember here is that when Asian giant hornet is removing that thoracic muscle, it's usually not happening at the beehive. It's usually happening at another site further away. So um, if you have bees, you know, right outside your colony that are missing, that have a hole in their thorax, um, that probably wasn't Asian giant hornet. It was probably something else. Um, so the outcome of this hunting phase, again, is that these dead bees or bees with holes in the thorax are not uh, near the bee colony entrance. Um, the bee colony will also still be alive at this point, right? So they're just sort of picking off individual bees. They haven't occupied the hive. They haven't entered the slaughter phase. So um, they'll kind of just pick off, you know, a few bees here and there. And we have other predators who do this as well. Other types of hornets, bald-faced hornet, yellow jackets um, are really bad this time of year, especially. So there are other things that, you know, you'll see hovering outside the entrance of your colony, kind of checking things out. And there are great resources online for how to compare what an Asian giant hornet looks like compared to these other types of wasps and hornets that might be trying to snack on your bees. Um, and then, you know, we can move into that slaughter phase, which has a terrifying name, um, where the Asian giant hornet invades the hive in large numbers. Um, and here they will, you know, recruit many individuals to the hive. Um, and also, you know, this usually is only happening to one hive at a time. So they're usually only mass recruiting and totally ganging up on one hive at a time. It's not normally, you know, some people report concerns that, you know, both of their hives or a few different hives in their apiary kind of all tanked at the same time and they're concerned it was Asian giant hornet. Usually when we're in this slaughter phase, they're only focusing their attention on one colony at a time. And, you know, I guess they could move to another one in the same apiary soon after, but, um, you know, for this matter of few days where the slaughter phase is going on, it should only be one hive. Um, and during this phase, the hornets will kill virtually 100% of the adult bee population. So um, this is where you could have massive piles of dead bees outside your colony where, um, you know, as Dr. Ramsey mentioned, they're just sort of quickly dispatching the adult bees and tossing them aside. They're not really feeding on the adult bees in this phase. So um, they're not digging out those thorax muscles. They're not, you know, boring a hole in the thorax. Um, so again, even in the slaughter phase, if you're seeing lots of dead bees around your hive, they probably should not have holes in the thorax um, because these hornets are not feeding on those adult bees. Um, you know, they're kind of just dispatching them so they can get at the brood. Um, so they will eat the hive's brood. So if you, you know, come to your colony after a while and you're colony has died since the last time you were there and you're going through there, um, you know, really characteristic uh, signal of giant hornet damage is that it will have no brood remaining. So if there's any brood left, um, probably was not the slaughter phase of the Asian giant hornet. Um, I've been hearing that they will usually leave honey stores untouched. So, you know, that can kind of be another symptom or signal to you that if your colony just totally tanked for whatever reason, but it has honey left, um, that can point to Asian giant hornet as opposed to um, another predator. And then they'll enter that occupation phase where they're occupying the hive for days afterwards. So that's obviously a pretty telltale sign if you show up to your hive and there's giant hornets in there, um, that it was Asian giant hornet and not something else. So, um, 
The outcomes of the slaughter phase are that there will be many dead bees around the hive, but usually without a hole in the thorax. Um, no adult bees are brood left in the hive. Typically, the honey will be left untouched, and Asian giant hornet will occupy and defend the hive for days afterwards. So, um, you know, we receive lots of reports from beekeepers that they're concerned about uh, Asian giant hornet or about other things. Um, so this photo was suspected Asian giant hor hornet damage that was submitted to the Washington State Department of Agriculture by a beekeeper. Um, and you can see this big, huge pile of dead bees um, near the colony. But you can also see these little holes in the thorax. You can see what I'm talking about, where um, something has actually bored out, you know, the kind of meaty inside of these bees thorax um, and eaten it or taken it home. So, um, again, if it's Asian giant hornet and we have a huge giant pile of dead bees, they're probably not going to have these holes in the thorax. So this is actually probably not damaged due to Asian giant hornet. Um, this these are photos from a suspected pesticide kill that were submitted by a beekeeper to the Idaho State Department of Agriculture. Um, again, you can see these huge piles of dead bees with holes in the thorax. Um, pesticides definitely don't bore out the thoracic muscles of the bees. So again, this is probably um, damage due to something else uh, like yellow jackets or another predator. But basically, you know, we're kind of getting these photos submitted to us um a lot of beekeepers reporting a lot of different concerns and so um you know my supervisor brandon hopkins had seen a bunch of these photos and then um at the time we were running an experiment on indoor storage of honeybee colonies where we had hives stored you know sealed indoors in cargo containers for multiple weeks um and then when he opened them up he saw this same exact type of damage where we have these huge piles of honeybee call or dead honeybees, you know, right underneath the hives. Um, they've got their thoraxes bored out. Something's been snacking on them. Um, and these were in Othello, Washington, where our new um, research facility is here. So, you know, he knew that that definitely was not Asian giant hornet, of course. These colonies were literally stored indoors. Um, you know, miles and miles and miles away, several counties away from where Asian giant hornet has been detected. So he, my supervisor, Brandon, really wanted to get to the bottom of this. And so he decided to put out trail cameras at our Othello facility and see if he could catch the culprit in action. And it turned out that we had little visitors coming to our hives at night and just, you know, popping in for a quick midnight snack or two. Um, so this damage was actually the result of mice. So for us, that case was solved with a simple trail camera that we had mice visiting our colonies um, and sort of nibbling on the thorax of those bees resulting in that damage. Um, there are other possible culprits. Uh, if you have many injured bees um, near a hive, especially near a hive that's still alive, um, you know, that can be yellow jackets or damage from another kind of wasp. Um, and if you have many intact bees, um, that are dead, so, um, you know, kind of sometimes we'll see large amounts of dead bees that have exited the hive for whatever reason, but they're intact, they're not injured or damaged in any way. Um, but that can be indicative of another cause of death, like a pathogen or a pesticide, um, something that, you know, results in a lot of bees dying at once without physically damaging their bodies. So, um, you know, hopefully that can kind of just give you a little bit more context about what it actually looks like, um, at your hive. Um, and all of this is also in a fact sheet and I'll share the title of that fact sheet, um, just right after this, but we also included this flow chart in that fact sheet to kind of help people walk through and diagnose, um, what might be wrong with their colonies if they're seeing this type of damage. So, um, you know, the first step Beekeepers say, you know, I have a lot of dead bees outside my hive's entrance. Is that damage from Asian giant hornet? The very first question to ask is, is your hive located in Northwest Washington state? Because if it's not, then that's not Asian giant hornet. Because so far, you know, it's only um, in that very small area in Northwest Washington state. If you are located there, which, you know, many of you on this webinar probably are, um, 
then you can kind of start moving down the flow chart. So if those dead bees outside your hive have holes in their thorax, um, then it's probably also unlikely Asian giant hornet because again, they're only moving those bee thoracic muscles away from the hive in the hunting phase. So this is probably damage from another predator like a mouse, um, a shrew or a yellow jacket, um, something else that's going on, snacking on the bees right where the hive actually is. Um, if those bees don't have holes in the thorax, you can um, check your hive to see if there's any living bees or brood left. Um, if there are any living bees or brood left and your colony is still intact, um, you know, it's also probably unlikely Asian giant hornet. They will usually only leave dead bees right outside the hive in that slaughter phase where they would, you know, take out all the adult bees in the colony and not leave any brood behind. Then you can check to see if there's any honey left in your hive. Um, if there's not any honey left, um, again, you know, that kind of points away from Asian giant hornet. They'll usually leave the honey untouched because uh, they're really just interested in that protein rich brood. Um, so if your hive has no bees, brood, or honey, it's probably, you know, a death from other causes. Um, if it had no honey before, you know, that's kind of an indicator that maybe it died from starvation um, or another cause. And then of course, if there's Asian giant hornet occupying or defending the hive, that's definitely Asian giant hornet and you should report it to the Washington State Department of Agriculture. Um, even if there's not, and it's been a while since we've checked on your hive, um, but all of these other things are true, are happening, then it's possible that that was Asian giant hornet. And, you know, really, if you're suspicious at all, if you're not quite sure, it's definitely better to just err on the side of caution and report it. You know, people will come and investigate and, you know, ask you more questions and do further research. Um, but we definitely don't want to deter anyone away from reporting who might suspect um, that there's Asian giant hornet nearby. Um, so again, all of this information is summarized in a new fact sheet. Um, and this is still kind of in the review process through WSU extension, but it's in kind of the final stages there. So it should be um, ready for you to access very soon. This is my email here at WSU. Um, so you can feel free to contact me with questions afterwards. Um, but also, you know, there's lots of amazing resources online and people's information for you to contact there um, who are closer located to where Asian giant hornet um, is a problem and who could actually come out to help you. Um, and it probably won't be me coming out in person. So um, yeah, I, I encourage you to just Google Asian giant hornet, Washington State Department of Agriculture for more resources for sure. Um, but I think that's it for me. And I'm sure people have <laughs> Thank you. Lots of questions, um, especially after Sammy's amazing presentation. I learned a ton for sure. <laughs> um, Thank you. Great. Okay, so um, Sammy, I don't know if you want to go ahead and take over sharing your screen. Um, I know you had some resources listed there that you wanted to um, show. I have one up right now, but if you want to take it back over, just let me know and I'll make you the presenter. There okay. was a few questions that came through the chat box. Um, so I'll go ahead and moderate and read those out to you as they come. If you are listening in and you don't have access to the chat box and you're unable to um, show that up, go ahead and raise your hand and I can unmute you so you can. Oops, sorry, so you can ask that question. So there was a question that came through the chat box um, earlier. Um, and this is for um, whoever wants to go ahead and answer it, but um, it says in SEAs. So, how are feral bee colonies able to survive versus managed colonies? Are feral colonies much more rare because beekeepers are not around to protect them? So, uh, I can jump in with that one because I'm going to assume um, for SEA. So, you're talking about Southeast Asia, um, and in Southeast Asia, there tend not to be. Uh, Actually, I've never encountered a feral Apis mellifera colony. Uh, Apis mellifera, those those bees are just not native to the area, and as a result, the different parasites there, like the tropolelaps mite, 
uh, the, the different predators, like the multiple species of hornets that go after bees from Vespa soror, Vespa mandarinia, Vespa affinis, Vespa tropica. There's just too much going on. They get destroyed so quickly. If not for the constant management of beekeepers, uh, those colonies simply would not be able to survive. Um, now, other species do have abilities that they can use to um, protect themselves against the hornets, but we have not seen these consistently presenting in Apis mellifera. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have another question here in the chat box, um, and this is kind of flipping over to the other side. Does anyone know if it's possible to have a secondary critter eat the thorax muscles of honeybees after they have had the heads whacked off and are dead in a pile, like a yellow jacket or a mouse? I think that one's for you, Kelly. Yeah, um, I do think that that's a possibility um, for sure. Um, I think, you know, if there are like freshly dead bees outside the hive, there will be opportunistic predators who will come around and snoop and snack. Um, I'm not sure how frequently that's the case. Um, yeah, I don't know. Sammy, do you have anything to add? The, when the hornets are chopping up bees, they are incredibly wasteful. They're not actually eating the, uh, the bees themselves when they go into the slaughter phase. They're just going after the brood. So they leave behind the honey and they leave behind a whole bunch of honeybee thoraces and dead bodies. So other creatures do often show up. We've seen lots of tiny little uh, rodents running around, uh, coming after the, the remnants of a colony that's been cleaned out. Uh, you also see creatures going after the honey. So there are, uh, if you guys have ever seen Silence of the Lambs, those really big moths, uh, the death's head moths, uh, will show up in colonies and, and feed on the remainder of the honey that's present. Uh, so yeah, other creatures can get in there and, and feed on the remains. Awesome. Um, is there any knowledge or speculation if Asian giant hornets would be able to survive um, without honeybees? Oh, um, so yes, Asian giant hornets actually can survive without honeybees. So they're not obligate predators of honeybees because they are generalists. When they, for most of the year, they're not going after bees. They're consuming whatever large bodied insects are in the area and sometimes lizards or frogs as well, but mostly things like grasshoppers, katydids, praying mantids, and then, oh, and lots of beetles. They really like beetles. But then when they start producing queens, they need much more protein and they need to make sure that they can get a lot of protein very efficiently. The best way to do that is to get it all from one place at the same time. And so that's when they start going after different social species. So it's not just the bees, they'll go after bumblebees, or sorry, it's not just the honeybees. They'll go after bumblebees, they'll go after yellow jacket wasps, paper wasps, uh, anything that keeps a bunch of brood all in one place they will go after them. And so even if honeybees aren't present, as long as there are some um, eusocial insects living with the queen and a bunch of babies in one place, they can sustain themselves. Awesome. The questions are really rolling in through the chat box. Um, <laughs> does it is. <laughs> so this isn't going to be really pertain to um, us up here in Washington. This question may be coming from somewhere else. Um, does anyone have any information on if Asian giant, actually, I'm going to go ahead and hold that question for last. Um, we will come back to and revisit it, but, um, I want to pertain to some of the questions that, um, might be impacting the response here in Whatcom County and Washington specifically. Um, so this is a question about researching Asian giant hornets in the terms of kind of reducers or a hornet or wasp trap that was used in. Europe that attaches to the bottoms of the hive. Um, have you seen this and do you know if this would be effective for Asian giant hornet as well? Should I jump in with that one? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I'm like answering things in the chat. But I think <laughs> oh, I got gotcha. you. Answer uh, in there. <laughs> divide and conquer. Um, yeah. So I have seen these traps and they are ingenious and I think they're really cool. 
Um, but the ones that they are using in Europe are primarily geared toward a different Asian hornet species. So uh, there is, and I know that this is really confusing, but there's one hornet called the Asian hornet, and there's another one called the Asian giant hornet. And it is terrible that these names are typically used. So we've been trying to get a, a better um, a common name for the one that we're seeing over there in uh, in Europe. But the one that we're seeing in Europe, um, which we also call the Asian yellow-legged hornet, that one is a type of hornet that does not invade the colony itself. It flies in front of the colony and it'll snatch the bees out of the air in a behavior that's called bee hawking. So they'll fly down, they'll grab a bee, and just like Kelly was saying earlier, they'll then fly into a tree and chop all the legs and wings off and turn it into a meatball and fly that back to the colony. They don't go after the brood. They're not, um, their behaviors are not designed to actually get into the colony. So those traps that are on the front of the colony are baited with uh, orange juice or uh, wine vinegar, and the hornets will go into a one-way entrance and get stuck inside of that trap. The Asian giant hornets have a trap that was designed for them in Japan uh, that is much larger, much uh, more ostentatious looking, um, but can be pretty effective in trapping them as well is the way that um, Apis mellifera is able to be kept so consistently in Japan where Asian giant hornets are just very, very, very common. Awesome, thank you. Um, here's another question. Um, is it inevitable that Asian giant hornet will spread to the whole Pacific Northwest region? Also, are they found in urban areas? What does that look like for densely populated areas? Um, I'll quickly, there's a couple of scientific studies talking about this potential spread of Asian giant hornet. Um, the first one that came out was kind of just a climatic study, right? Um, and the Pacific Northwest looked like a good area based solely on that um, weather factors, et cetera. Um, I can tell you that the nest that Dr. Ramsey brought up at the very beginning that was removed from Nanaimo was actually inside of a forest park that happened to be smack dab in the middle of the town in an urban setting. Um, and I'll let um, either of the other speakers elaborate on this further if they're interested. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just say, I don't think it's inevitable that they'll spread to the whole region. <laughs> you know, hopefully not. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, do you have any, any in, insight? I, I, <laughs> I was just, I meant if you guys wanted to talk more about them, um, being able to be found in urban areas, yeah, right? As yeah. the state agency and us beekeepers, if we work together to stop them and continue to do what we do, yes. hopefully we have a good fight. We're getting good at tracking them, but, um, you know, urban areas, any thoughts on that? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it, it is unfortunate to say that, um, we, we can't quite rely on just the. Uh, the literature that is present about these hornets, because a lot of the work that's been done on these hornets has been done on uh, a very small localization of these hornets in a very small area of their geographic range. Um, we have reason to believe that there are multiple subspecies or at least distinctive haplotypes for these hornets. So basically genetically distinct groups that are still the same species. And some of these genetically distinct groups have different behaviors. So even though a lot of what's been described of them in Japan has talked about how they stay away from human beings, they uh, stay only in these very heavily forested, very infrequently um, trafficked regions, there's that one in Nanaimo that was just right smack dab in the middle of uh, a park that has foot traffic all the time. And so um, oftentimes you'll also see different behaviors in organisms when they're moved to a new location. They don't have the normal sets of, um, of environmental reinforcements that keep certain sets of behaviors going. So it's possible that they could end up in circumstances where they are nesting in regions where human beings are actually free frequenting those areas. It is not an inevitability that these hornets will become established. You have the Washington State Department of Agriculture to thank for that, in addition to the United States Department of Agriculture and APHIS. 
Um, there's a lot of work being done, money being spent and man hours being invested into making sure that these hornets do not become an established feature of our environment. And I think that they have every possibility to succeed. And I'm really looking forward to seeing um, the, the, the fruits of this work. Awesome. So um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up a couple questions in the chat box. That seems to kind of, if you have any last questions, put them in the chat box now. Um, the questions are kind of switching over to WSC efforts currently wanting a quick update. So far this year, we've caught four Asian giant hornets and bottle traps. Um, and yes, we do work with Canada. Um, we meet bi weekly. Canada, if they have detections near the border, they alert us. Same as well. Um, Canada actually has worked with us a couple times this year um, where we have been in the process of tracking hornets and they have gone over on their side and looked. Um, they trap and they ask citizens to report as well. Um, so with that being said, uh, I think that would be about uh, it for questions. Um, again, beekeepers, especially you, those of you inside um, Washington State, if you have suspect any sightings, you suspect any hive attacks, get those reports into the Department of Agriculture. Um, if anyone's interested in connecting with others, we have a Facebook group here. Um, Dr. Samuel Ramsey or Dr. Kelly, is there any like last minute comments um, or any of your contact information or anything you want to share before we say good night? I don't think so. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. I'm really glad to get to speak with you. And if you want to follow more um, updates from the work that I'm conducting in, in Asia or just generally the, the, the goofiness of my scientific life, uh, you can find that on Twitter at Dr. Sammy Tweets, and you can also find me on Instagram at Dr. Sammy Grams. Thanks, everyone, and have a nice evening. Have a great evening, everyone. See ya.